So in this video, what we're going to be taking a look at is allocative efficiency. And in case you haven't quite picked up on it yet, as we've gone through this video series, as we've gone through this semester, uh, economists were really interested in maintaining and obtaining efficiency. So as we move through this section in this video in particular, we're going to explore a concept known as allocative efficiency. We're going to be taking a look at when it's met and at times when it's not met and how government intervention well, at times it can force us into an inefficient scenario. And then as we carry on, we're also going to be taking a look at cases where we can actually utilize government intervention to push the market towards efficiency, at least push us towards allocative efficiency. Very rarely would the government be able to actually achieve allocative efficiency, but likely they'd be able to push us closer to efficiency than the market could obtain on its own given cer certain uh, situations. So objectives of this video, what are we actually hitting as we go through? So first thing, we're going to define allocative efficiency. We're going to take a look at what this is, what we mean by it, and look at that. We're then going to be able to identify an allocatively efficient outcome in a market. So identify when that is, when that isn't the case. And then finally, we're going to identify and compute. There's that compute word again, doing a bit of math. Uh, we're going to compute social welfare through what is known as a surplus analysis. So we'll be taking a look at consumer surplus, producer surplus, and then social surplus altogether. So let's take a look at this concept of allocative efficiency to start off. So, so what we're looking at with allocative efficiency is how we're allocating our resources and ensuring that we're allocating the right resources to the right goods and services. In order to see this kind of in its original kind of sense, let's take a look at, and okay, trust me, before I start off on this, many people glaze over with this diagram. They go, oh my goodness, I hope I never have to replicate this. Don't worry, you don't. It's just a way to take a look at this to start off. So let's suppose we're taking a look at the comparison between cars and trucks again. So let's take a look at that. And let's take a look at the production possibility frontier between cars and between trucks. And we're going to have our production possibility frontier such that, there we go, we'll assume linearity, right, just to make things easy for us. And here we go, we have our trade-off every time we decide to produce another truck, we have to give out so many cars. Keep in mind that technically this is, let's keep our colors the same, this is my quantity cars, this is my quantity of trucks being produced in each extreme. So what we could do is we could then carry down and we could go like so. And uh, let's use the right tool here. We could carry forward the same axes, so quantity of trucks and price. And I could take a look at my market for trucks. So let's do that. Let's suppose that in my market for trucks, I'm going to have some demand of trucks. So let's uh, label our curves. There's my demand curve. And then very similarly, I'm going to have some supply of trucks. And okay, keep in mind, right, we don't have to get too finicky, but technically there's my 100% of truck production. That'd be my maximum truck. So that'd be where that cutoff there is for my ability to produce. Right, we don't need to worry about that too much, but technically it's kind of our bound that exists there. Given technology, yada, 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 yada. Okay, then what we're going to obtain is we're going to obtain some market price and some market quantity exchange. So there is my quantity of trucks and my price of trucks. And if we kind of carry this line up, what we can see is that it goes to some point on our production possibility frontier. That means by us having this quantity of trucks, we are going to have some quantity of cars. And okay, so that means that we could bounce all this and we could take a look at the other side. So let's, let's bounce it around and let's take a look at what's happening. So what we're going to do is we're going to create just a, don't get too caught up in what's happening here. This is just going to be a reflection line. So I'm going to have quantity cars. I'm going to have quantity cars. So same happening on both sides. All this is, is just going to be a 45 degree line. Just a reflection line here. 
such that, right, if I were to go and take this entire car situation, bounce it off, boom, there would be my full production of cars. And then very similarly, if I did zero trucks, well, zero, sorry, 100% trucks, zero cars, I would similarly have zero cars. The whole reason why I want to do this whole balance line is because what I want to do is I want to switch in order to have price of cars, quantity of cars, so I can take a look at both markets, right? So what did we have going on here? We had our quantity of cars hitting our balance line and bouncing down as such. So that is by producing this amount of trucks, production possibility frontier, it must also then have that amount of cars occurring. So if we took a look at that, that would mean that I would have my demand, demand, and I would similarly over here have my supply. And we see, okay, here we go. We are in kind of an equilibrium in both markets. And I have my price of both goods. And we're happy we have equilibrium all together. But let's look at what happens. Let's keep in mind my interpretation of some of these curves. Keep in mind supply. This is also marginal cost, right? My cost of production. And demand, this is also my marginal benefit. So, okay, right now at these equilibrium points, we have a case such that the extra benefit received from a truck is one and the same as the extra cost which we incurred to produce it. That is extra cost equals extra benefit. But let's suppose that for some reason, we were to ramp up truck production. So if we were to ramp up truck production, all else constant, that is, we decided just to boom, super produce trucks. Well, if we decide to super produce trucks, that means that we have to be decreasing our car production. So there we go, quantity trucks prime, quantity cars prime. What we find over here is, okay, for this last truck produced, uh, maybe let's go use same color here. For this last truck produced, what did I get? I got a marginal cost there. For that last truck produced, I only received a marginal benefit here. That is, this last truck produced gave me much more cost to society than society received in benefit. That's problematic, right? We are utilizing more resources, society is facing more cost from producing trucks than we were getting in benefit from consuming them. This is, this is a waste, right? We're no longer getting benefit equal to cost. We're getting far more cost than benefit. Well, what's happening on the car side? Well, over on the car side, we're getting a marginal cost down over here. So very low cost for that last car produced, but we are getting benefit, marginal benefit, the extra benefit I received for that last car produced up here. I mean, I'm getting a whole bunch of extra benefit versus cost. Big thing is we look through both sides, right? If we keep in mind, remember what we said, we can aggregate underneath these curves to get total benefit. We can aggregate underneath them to get total cost. What we witness over on this side, by getting over here, I am going to incur, let's see if I can show this in somewhat of a nice way. Past this equilibrium point, I'm going to be incurring all of this as my extra cost, but I'm going to be incurring all of this as my benefit, right? Past equilibrium, we could shade in this whole bit, but I'm just interested in this bit beyond equilibrium. And what we realize is that altogether, I am just facing cost, right? I have this cost over benefit. So by overproducing trucks, I just face an extra cost as a society. 
cost greater than benefit. Uh, my costs are rising. I'm not getting any extra benefit. I'm just, I'm losing, right? I'm not being very efficient in my use of my resources, in allocating my resources. What about over here? Well, over in this case, okay, we could work through it in much the same way. In this case, I'll work through. I'm getting marginal benefit all underneath that, right? I'd be getting all of this kind of area as my total benefit. I'd be getting all of this area as my total cost. So, okay, my benefit's winning out. I'm getting more benefit than cost. But take a look at this. If I kept producing two equilibrium, well, I'd face all of this as cost, sure. So, okay, that'd be the extra cost I would incur. What am I getting as benefit, though, if I went all the way to equilibrium? I'd be getting all of this as benefit. That is, by increasing truck production, I just face extra cost over benefit. So, okay, costs go up faster than benefit. And also, by increasing trucks, I decrease cars. I am unable to get this area. Right? I'm not getting this area here because I have held my consumption of cars and my production of cars down because I ramped up trucks. So what's happening altogether in society? We don't get that benefit. We face this extra cost. So X, bad, right? We could go sad face we've lost that benefit because we're holding car production low we face all of this extra cost that's sad as well two negatives not very good right and we have an inefficient situation that is if we just move back to this equilibrium point on each well if we went to the equilibrium point on each we would have our benefit this all this blue area versus our cost, and hey, total benefit exceeds our total cost, we're good, we're happy. Over here, we didn't shade it in, but let's shade it in now. We had our benefit, so underneath the marginal benefit curve, all the way out to equilibrium, right? So we have all of that as benefit. Let's just shade that in. We would have all of this as cost underneath the marginal cost curve. Well, we have the same thing, right? We have benefit over cost. We're winning. We're happy as society. We have more benefit than we have cost. Our net benefit is positive. So issue, if we deviate, if our quantity exchange deviates from this equilibrium, if we increase, our costs rise faster than our benefits, making us sad. If we decrease, we give up more benefit than we give up costs. That is, we lose out on benefits, making us sad. So what we find altogether is that anytime our quantity exchange deviates from the equilibrium quantity exchanged, we are going to end up in a worst case scenario. We are not going to be getting as much benefit as we could we would say that this is an allocatively inefficient scenario if we find any level of quantity exchange deviating from equilibrium. So how do we know we are at an allocatively efficient outcome? Well, allocative efficiency, we can very simply refer to allocative efficiency. We can say that we are allocatively efficient when price equals marginal cost. That is, right, price equals marginal cost at our quantity exchanged. So if we go back to this example here, at quantity cars, boom, there's my marginal cost, boom, there's my price, Marginal cost equals price. Over in this case here, at my initial quantity exchanged up, boom right there, there's my marginal cost. We have allocative efficiency right at equilibrium. But what happened? What happened when we deviated? What happened when we went down there? What happened when we went up in trucks? 
Well, let's take a look, right? You're like, oh, but doesn't price stay the same? No, it doesn't. Keep in mind what we also have for our demand curve, marginal benefit or maximum willingness to pay. So, okay, if this is my maximum willingness to pay, the highest price we could charge for this Q prime T would be right there. Let's, let's use green to denote this. That would be this price there. So, okay, at Q prime T, we would have a price as such. What's my marginal cost at this? Well, my marginal cost is up to my supply curve. I would have my marginal cost there. So, okay, price does not equal marginal cost. I have all this extra cost over benefit. My social welfare is lower, right? I'm just facing extra cost. I'm not getting any social benefit from producing trucks anymore. Inefficient use of resources. Inefficient. Price does not equal marginal cost. What about this side? Well, okay, to start off, Q prime C. There's my marginal cost. Where's my price? Is it still this price? Well, what we have to think about is that if this is the quantity exchanged, what's going to be the price? Well, typically the price is going to come from our demand curve because that's what suckers are willing to pay, right? If that's what they're willing to pay to buy the good, that's, that's what you're going to charge. So Q prime C up to our demand, that would be my price. And what we witness is that again, price and marginal cost are not the same at this lower quantity. And because they're not the same, what has happened? We have given up all of this area here as benefit over cost. If we just increased production, we could capture this. But by holding production low, we lose out. We don't get to capture that. And because we hold it low, we don't get to capture that. We are inefficient. We are not allocating our resources properly. So big, long-winded way to say that allocative efficiency occurs when price equals marginal cost. This efficiency, allocative efficient level of output of production is going to be a key factor that we're going to look at as we carry forward through this course. So let's expand upon this farther. Let's expand upon these whole areas underneath the curves with an idea known as surplus. Let's take a look at that. Okay, so another way that we can think about this allocative efficiency is we can take a look at this surplus that producers and consumers get from engaging in trade, right? And really all this links right back to what we we're talking about at the start with trade is that, hey, when we engage in trade, we have a maximum willingness to pay, a minimum willingness to accept. These guys are different and we can negotiate some price in between such that we're both happy, such that we can have these gains from trade. So let's take a look. Let's take a look at some example here. And we're going to start off just taking a look at a generic case. We'll then introduce the math and compute it accordingly. So generic case. Let's suppose that we have just some market We'll have our price, we'll have our quantity downward sloping here. I'll have my market demand. So, okay, demand, we can also think of this as the marginal benefit or our maximum willingness to pay. Very similarly, going the other way, we can have our supply. And keep in mind, this is also our marginal cost or the minimum price that we would be willing to accept. Okay, as we go through this, what do we end up with? Well, we get our equilibrium quantity exchanged and our equilibrium price. So let's go Q prime and P prime. So we've already taken a look at, and we quickly looked at it again, is that, hey, we can calculate total benefit Right, we can calculate total benefit by aggregating underneath this marginal benefit curve. And we can say, hey, all this area here is the total benefit from consuming this good. 
In the same way, we can aggregate underneath the marginal cost curve to find the total cost of production. And hey, we look at total benefit minus total cost, and we see that, hey, we get this kind of net benefit equal to this. It's kind of our net benefit, our leftover. And we see, okay, yeah, net benefit's positive. We're winning out. We actually get more benefit from society from engaging in trade than we do just producing ourselves and consuming ourselves. This little green is kind of our gains from trade in this scenario. We can also think about this in a different way, though. Let's just back up. And let's kind of think about this in terms of our minimum willingness to accept and our maximum willingness to pay. So starting off with this whole maximum willingness to pay curve. Let's keep in mind that although my maximum willingness to pay was all here going down, the price that I paid, right, even though I had this high maximum willingness to pay for this like first unit, given the market price, the price that I did pay was that. Although I had this high maximum willingness to pay here, the price that I paid was here. On and on and on, right? High maximum actual price paid. High maximum actual price paid. All the way up to Q star, where my maximum limits to pay and the price paid were one and the same. So if we take a look at that, what we could say is, hey, look at this. I paid low price. I was willing to pay this high price. I gained this difference here. I gained all of that difference as surplus. So what I could do is I could work out my surplus received for all the way to Q star as this entire difference between the price that I actually paid versus the price I was willing to pay. And we get this whole triangle up here, this whole above the price, below my maximum willingness to pay. This whole triangle up here, we will refer to this as our consumer surplus, right? And this is the surplus we received by paying the market price versus the price that we were willing to, right? And if we kind of go back to that whole trade scenario, if we go back and think about the trade scenario, one way to think about why this is my maximum willingness to pay is because, okay, I'm willing to pay this price because that would be the cost of me doing it myself. So in this case here, this is kind of the gains from trade that the consumer gets from buying from the producer rather than producing it themselves. So we see that, okay, I get these gains from trade, I get this consumer surplus from paying it, from buying you, paying you to do this for me, rather than doing it myself. Sometimes, right, even, the, even if you know how to fix your own car, it still makes sense to hire somebody else to fix your car. Even though you know how to do gardening or landscaping, it still makes sense at times to pay somebody else to do it for you. Because it might be that the cost of you doing it is up here, right? Cost of you doing it is up here, but the market price is down there. And that is you can get this surplus, these gains from trade by actually engaging in trade, hiring someone rather than doing it yourself at this high price. So that's our consumer surplus. Very similarly, we have a very similar idea with our producer. For our producers, we have our minimum willingness to accept. Well, let's use red, let's switch colors here. We have our minimum willingness to accept. So keep in mind this here, the minimum price I'd be willing to accept in order to produce. So right along this line, such that Right, if we keep in mind back to our trade, the reason this is my minimum willingness to accept is this was my cost to produce that unit. And so, okay, I was willing to accept this low price here, but what do I actually accept? I actually get this market price. So, okay, I was willing to accept a low price, but I get the market price. I've just won, right? I have just received, once again, uh, sorry, colors. Once again, I have received surplus. We could carry on the same kind of way, right? I was willing to accept this low price. I did accept the actual market price. On and on and on and on until the last unit where that market price was one and the same as my minimum willingness to accept. 
just as we did for our consumer surplus then, we could shade all of this in. We could aggregate this entire triangle here. And we could calculate all of this as my consumer surplus. So, okay, my consumer surplus. Sorry, no. Bad consumer on the brain. We're talking about the producer here. We're talking about the firm, the creator of goods and services. This is my producer surplus. So difference between the price that I was willing to sell my good for at minimum and the actual trade price, which we engaged in the market price. And what we see is that, well, both sides, consumers and producers both gain from trade. The producer, because they get to sell higher than they were willing to, Consumer, because they get to buy cheaper than what it would cost them to do themselves or what they're willing to pay. And so we both gain from trade. The overall gains we get all together is these two surpluses together. Consumer plus producer is our social surplus. Our total gains from trade between the both parties. And Surplus is maximized at the equilibrium, right? Surplus is maximized at the allocatively efficient point. Again, this allocatively efficient point is when marginal cost equals the price. And is that true here? We have price, so at Q, at our quantity exchange right there, boom, we have our price and we have supply, marginal cost, that line, straight through. So yes, at equilibrium, price equals marginal cost. At equilibrium, we have the highest possible level of social surplus. Thus, we are allocatively efficient. This whole surplus analysis, this is also great because what this allows us to do is we can say, okay, great. We get our net benefit to society, our social surplus, but we can also look at the distributional effects. We can take a look at how much of this surplus is received from the consumer. We can take a look at how much of this surplus, this benefit, is received by the producer. What is the distribution between these two players? And this is often an area of interest for us, right? As we're talking about um, kind of this idea of equality or equal distribution. What this also allows us to do is that later, if you want to implement kind of government interventions or have the government start to play around in this market, well, if the government starts to influence things, starts to play around and change things in this market, we can work out how that changes the surplus for all of society, for the consumers, and for the producers. We can kind of witness, okay, what is the gain? What is the loss to each one? And is a government's policy kind of favoring the consumer, favoring the producer? what is going on there, who's our winners, who's our losers. So big aspect of this analysis. What we'll do next is we'll kind of do the same thing here. We just kind of shaded in and identified consumer and producer surplus. We'll do the same thing in another example, but we'll introduce numbers. We'll introduce, hey, here is a demand curve represented by the following function. Here is a supply curve represented by the following function. And we'll actually calculate the value of consumer surplus, the value of producer surplus, and the value of social surplus. So let's take a look at that next. Okay, so let's presume we have the following market such that we have price equals 5 plus 2Q and price equals 55 minus 3Q. So, okay, keep in mind, in this case, I'm not telling you which one supply is. I'm not telling you which one demand is. You need to infer that for yourself. How do we figure out which one's which? Well, keep in mind, law of supply. Supply is upward sloping, so it has a positive slope. Positive slope. Demand is downward sloping, so it has a negative slope. Negative slope. So we would have supply and demand. What we want to do here is we want to graph this and we want to calculate what our surplus would be. So that is we want to calculate the value of our consumer surplus, the value of our producer surplus, and then the value of society surplus altogether. So let's take a look at that. 
first thing I want to do, and you don't, you can actually do it entirely mathematically, but I like to have the visual so I can kind of keep track as to what I'm doing. First thing, let's graph it. Let's graph it here. So we have price, we have quantity, and starting off with my demand, I have 55. Okay. 55 negative slope so dropping down there I have my horizontal intercept keep in mind how we can find that rapidly we take our vertical divide by the magnitude of our slope so 55 divided by 3 that's going to give me 18.33 okay technically 33333 repeating but 18.33 for my supply curve what do I have here Starting off at five, so okay, kind of rough scale here. Let's put that as five. And then increasing at a slope of two. So okay, kind of getting a rough idea. Two is smaller than three. So the supply of, sorry, the slope of my supply is gonna be a little bit shallower. So right, that would be one and the same for each. Let's go a little bit shallower for my supply curve just to kind of give us a rough idea as to what we're dealing with. So there's my supply, there's my demand. Okay, what do we have next? We have our equilibrium quantity exchanged and our corresponding market price. Price and quantity. What we want to calculate, we want to figure out what is my consumer surplus and what is my producer surplus right keep in mind if you saw consumer surplus is this triangle here below my willingness to pay above the price i do pay producer surplus above my willingness to accept below the price that i do accept so okay we need to calculate this how do we calculate this we don't have right we only have two numbers 55 and 5 well, keep in mind, these are just triangles. So consumer surplus is one half base times height. And producer surplus, another triangle, is going to be just, again, one half base times height. Well, okay, what's, what's my base? What's my height, right? Well, for both of these guys, our height, sorry, our base, rather, would be just between zero and Q. That would be my base. Our height, well, our height for each respective one would be between five and P. That would be my height for my producer surplus. And for my consumer, my height would be between P and 55. There's the height for the consumer surplus. So, Okay, we hopefully can see in this that in order to calculate this, I need to find out what P is. I need to find out what Q is. So I need to solve for my equilibrium before I can solve for my surplus. So let's do that to start off. How do we get these values? Well, again, we set supply equal to demand. So price equal to price. 5 plus 2q equals 55 minus 3q. I don't like the negatives. I want to get rid of them. So let's add 3q to both sides. I get 5 plus 5q equals 55. Let's isolate the q. 5q equals 50. Divide both sides by 5 to get that q by itself. And we get q equal to 10. So, okay, let's update that. That is a quantity of 10. And hey, that kind of works. If that's 18, this is 0. Yeah, that's about where I'd expect it to be. Cool. Looking good. Market price. Well, to get the market price, I can take this and put it back into one or both of these equations. If I do both, I should get the same number. And I can get my price. I'm going to throw it back in my supply just because that looks easier mathematically. 5 plus 2 times 10. So that is equals 5 plus 20. I get a price of 25. So let's update that guy. There we go. Price of 25. 
Okay, let's update my heights and my bases now. So what do I have? Base, well, that's going to be a base of 10. Height of my producer surplus, between 5 and 25. So 25 minus 5. That gives me a height of 20. What about my consumer surplus? What do I have here? 55 minus 25. Well, that's going to give me a height of 30. So, okay, now I have all the numbers I need in order to calculate my surpluses. So let's go about and do, do that. Let's start off by calculating our consumer surplus first. So I have one half base of 10 height of 30. So what does that work out? 2.5 times 10 times 30 equals 150. So all that consumer surplus there is monetarily equivalent to $150. That's how much kind of I gain from paying somebody else to do it for me rather than doing it myself. On the other side, my producer surplus, one half, base times 10, sorry, base of 10, times a height of 20. And what is that going to give me? 0.5 times 10 times 20. That will give me 100. So again, from the producer's side, from producing for somebody else rather than just producing for myself, I get a producer surplus of 100. What about society altogether? What is society's surplus? How much does society gain from having trade rather than just everybody being self-sufficient and doing it themselves? Well, society's surplus is the surplus of consumers and the surplus of producers. So altogether, the surplus to society from engaging in trade, from buying and selling this good is $250, right? The 150 from the consumer, the 100 from the producer, giving us 250. That is... This entire bit here, this net benefit, as it were, if we were thinking about it in benefit terms, that net benefit is our social surplus. And we see, okay, net benefit to society and then how it's distributed between consumers and producers. Okay, so that wraps up our whole bit on calculating surplus. We'll go through one more example for this. We'll go back to one of the ones we looked at in a previous in our previous video and we'll work through calculating that. Rather, I'll put it up and then I'll say, hey, you work through it, pause the video and then carry on from there. So let's go price is 100 plus 5Q and price is 1600 minus 5Q. Once again, what we want to do is we want to calculate the producer surplus, the consumer surplus, and society's surplus from engaging in trade. To do so, you don't need to graph, but I find it extremely helpful to graph so I can visualize what's happening. We need to find our equilibrium price, our equilibrium quantity, and then from there, the surpluses for each one. So go ahead and work through that. Uh, you can pause the video. If not, the answer, the results are going to show up in three, two, one. Okay, so here we have, working through here, we have our equilibrium price of 850, equilibrium quantity exchanged of 150. Working through our producer and consumer surplus, starting off with our producer surplus, producer surplus being this triangle here. Well, we get that guy there is one half base times height. We have a base of 150, height of 750. So that yields one half 150 times 750, $56,250. From the other side for our producers, well, difference between my willingness to pay and the price that I actually pay, we get our consumer surplus. For a consumer surplus, we have one half base times height, so one half base of 150, height of 750, yielding again 56,250. Altogether, our social surplus then, our social surplus is the surplus received from the producer and from the consumer. So consumer and producer together gives us our yellow total triangle here, our net benefit to society. And in that case there, 
that is the $112,500. So surplus being calculated, how we do it, from equilibrium is our simplest case. As we move forward in the course, we're going to be implementing, we'll see in the next video, price controls that are going to limit the quantity or force a price on the market. This causes an allocatively inefficient scenario, creates different surpluses, and we'll witness how the surplus falls, and we'll witness how we have to calculate it by cutting up our areas into different triangles and squares. Initially though, at equilibrium or easiest case, everything is just a triangle, one half base time site. So that does us for our surplus, that does us for our basis of allocative efficiency, right? Again, keep in mind, allocative efficiency occurs when price equals marginal cost, right? The other way to think about that is when marginal benefit equals marginal cost. When that's the case, we are allocatively efficient, society is receiving the highest possible surplus it could receive. We are allocating our resources properly. We're getting the highest possible benefit out of the utilization of these scarce resources. So allocative efficiency, price equals marginal cost or marginal benefit equals marginal cost, surplus analysis. Any follow-up questions, again, please feel free to reach out by email or the D2L discussion board. Next, we're going to be taking a look at how the government intervenes, how the government gets involved, typically because they might be interested more in notions of fairness or equity than in these notions of efficiency. So let's take a look at that in the next video.